Consider funding this channel on Patreon for as little as $1 a month. Link is on the side of this Tropicana Reefer. Also, if you like this video, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. And don't forget to click the bell so you can be notified whenever I upload a video. In this video, I'm going to tell you a few examples of times I had to say no in the trucking industry, as well as show you this fictional route I'm working on for my train simulator. But first, I'll tell you a really funny story from when I was in truck driving school. We were having lunch in the break area, and a guy was arguing with his girlfriend over the phone. As it turned out, she did not like the fact that he was going to truck driving school, because I guess she wanted him home with her or some stupid reason. Either way, this caused him a bunch of unnecessary stress that he could have gotten rid of had he simply decided to leave her. <laughs> I mean, if a girl told me that she's going to leave me unless I quit my job, I would have just said, well, go ahead, no one's making you. I mean, seriously, she should be happy that he's trying to make sure he has a promising career so that they can have a roof over their head. But instead, she wants to be immature and be like, quit the job or I'm leaving. No, like, why would you even want to be with someone like that? Either way, the story continues. Another day, I see him driving away from the parking lot and I asked someone else what's going on and they told me that he told them his girlfriend told him that if he didn't come home right now she was going to leave him and I'm like why would you why why is he giving this girl this much power I don't understand why anyone would would give a girl that kind of power over their life it just doesn't make sense to me either way Later, he comes back and he's really angry, I'm guessing because she broke up with him, I, I didn't really get the details on that, but he goes to the guy that runs, he tells him if he doesn't give him a test date right now, he's going to beat him up. Now, as far as test dates are concerned, the manager gives you a test date when the trainers tell him that um, they think that you would pass the test if you were to take it. So. I guess he wasn't ready yet, so he wasn't given a test date, but he was starting to lose his patience. So he ends up threatening the guy, saying that he's going to hurt him if he doesn't give him a test date. So he calls the cops on him, obviously. So we're in the trucks, we're in the trucks outside in the parking lot practicing backing up when the person that's training us talks to us on the radio and tells us to stop the truck and put it in neutral with the brakes applied and let the cops through because the cops had to get through the parking lot to get into the building and we're sitting in the trucks thinking what's going on in there one of the people that was in the building actually tells us that the guy threatened the owner of the school and told him that if he didn't give him a test date right now he was going to harm him and as a result the manager of the school ended up having to call the cops on him so we see we see the guy walking out of the building with the cops and I don't know what happened but he ends up charging towards one of the cops who then ends up tasing him and then next thing we know he's in handcuffs being taken away I guess a good moral of that story would be to learn to control your temper. Now, if you have a problem with saying no, you're probably going to have a problem driving trucks because the word no is very important in the trucking industry. Why? Because customers ask you for a lot of ridiculous requests that you cannot fulfill or they ask you to do something that's dangerous. For example, I remember one time I told a customer I couldn't get the trailer exactly the way they wanted it because there was a bush in the way and they simply requested me to run over the bush and I told them, are you crazy? That's going to rip the airlines out from under the trailer. Like, use your brains, why don't you, before you make these requests. Customers are so stupid sometimes. To be fair, they've never driven the truck so they don't understand that you can't just run over anything. They also don't understand that trucks are not off-road vehicles, because I once had a customer tell me to uh, drive the truck in the mud to get the trailer the right angle, and I'm like, I can't drive on the mud. It's not an off-road vehicle. Why does everyone think trucks are off-road vehicles? Had you ever seen a truck driving in the mud? <laughs> now, here's a good example of a time I've had to say no to a customer. Now, I was in the Baltimore Harbor in Maryland, and I had just picked up a trailer that was bound for Wilkes Bar, Pennsylvania, off of I-476. I had driven the trailer quite a ways to a truck stop off of I-95, and 
I got a call from one of the workers at the docks saying that I have the wrong bill of lading. I picked up the bill of lading and it indeed was the wrong one. It said it was going to a different location. Now, I, I knew which trailer I had and I knew where the trailer was headed. But they had handed me the wrong bill of lading, which is a piece of paper that explains what trailer you're hauling, what cargo you're hauling, and where the cargo is headed. They actually asked me to drive all the way back to the Baltimore Harbor to pick up the correct bill of lading before heading back north towards Wilkes Bar, Pennsylvania. I told them, you're going to have to figure this one out on your own because I'm off duty right now. Which was true. I had run out of hours so I couldn't drive anywhere anyway. After he hung up, I went to a restaurant that was in the truck stop and then after having my dinner, I went to sleep. I woke up the next morning and they called me again, once again begging me to drive back to the Baltimore Harbor to pick up the correct bill of lading. I checked my map to uh, look at the traffic in the area and I confirmed that if I had driven all the way back to Baltimore and then went all the way back towards Wilkes Bar, it would have added an extra day to my journey because of how much traffic was on I-95 at the time. I told him I am absolutely not driving all the way back to Baltimore. This truck was going northbound toward Wilkes Bar, end of discussion. They said, but you have the wrong bill of lading, so I said to them, look, a bill of lading is a piece of paper, just fax it to the receiver and then they'll have it when I get there. They reluctantly agreed to fax them the bill of lading. So I get to Wilkes Bar where the trailer was supposed to be going and they asked for the bill of lading so I give it to them. They said this is the wrong one. So I said oh they said they were going to fax you the correct one. So they checked their faxes and lo and behold it was the wrong one. They had faxed them the wrong bill of lading and I'm like Man, what is wrong with these people in, in Baltimore? Why are they so incompetent that they can't even print the right piece of paper and fax it to someone? So after they told me they had the wrong bill of lading, I told them, well, there's nothing I can do about that, so you're just going to have to accept it. So he signed it and put a note on it that said, the bill of lading is incorrect, but it physically matches what was ordered. So it was accepted either way. Okay, so here's another example. I was making a delivery to another family dollar store. And the manager was helping me unload the trailer. Now, the whole time she was helping me unload the trailer, she was giving me a bunch of insults, basically telling me that I was unloading too slowly. And I'm thinking, why are you even in here if all you're going to do is insult me? And obviously this was starting to get really old really fast. Now, we got to the back of the trailer where there were a bunch of... Um, plastic containers. Now before she put them on the roller, I warned her, these plastic containers roll really fast down the rollers and these rollers are bent out of shape so if you put too many on at one time they're just gonna each roll off of the rollers. So instead just put one on at a time and slide it down by hand. But she didn't listen to me and she put all of them on at one time saying, are you kidding me? I don't have time for that. I'm in a hurry. So, like I predicted, they all fell off the roller. And then she tried to make me pick them up. And I told her, no, you pick them up. You're the one that dropped them. I already warned you that they were going to fall if you did that. And you didn't listen to me. This is your fault. You picked them up. I honestly don't understand what was wrong with that woman. Where did she get the idea that it's perfectly fine to ask someone else to pick up something that you dropped? I was always told that if you drop something... It's your responsibility to pick it back up, not someone else's. She obviously was never told that as a child. And now for yet another example. I was making a delivery to yet another family dollar store in Rochester, New York. And you know what? I'm starting to realize that a lot of my bad experiences in truck driving happened at family dollar stores. If I ever become a truck driver again, I'll try to make sure that I work only for companies that do not service family dollar. Either way, here's what happened. I arrived a day early and the manager told me to park the truck in front of a store that was next door to family dollar. So I'm thinking, okay, I guess this is where they usually unload the trucks. So the next day, I'm getting ready to prepare the trailer to be unloaded. I remove the seal, I open the door and everything. Then the manager walks up to me and tells me, 
Okay, we have a problem. You, you, you were just sleeping in the truck all, all morning, and we're supposed and we're ready for you to unload it. And I'm like, when did be sleeping in the truck? I've been up since 5:30 getting the trailer prepared to be loaded, and and no one has showed up to bring the rollers up to the trailer so I can unload it. And then she's like, well, you, well, you're supposed to have the truck over there so that we can unload it. And I'm like, why didn't you tell me that yesterday? I mean, seriously. How can you expect me to know where you, where you want me to put the trailer if you're not going to tell me where you want the trailer? So anyway, she uh, she makes a big deal because the trailer isn't where it's supposed to be, even though she didn't tell me where she wanted me to put the trailer in the first place. So after I after she tells me where she wants the trailer, I moved the trailer to that location. But there was a slight problem because it just snowed last night there was a bunch of snow all over the parking lot and it was shoveled into a pile right in front of the area where i needed to make the delivery and there wasn't enough space between the truck and the pile of snow for me to get the trailer exactly situated where she wanted it and then she got mad at me for not being able to get the trailer close enough to the store and i tried to explain to her the reason why I can't get the trailer exactly where you want it is because there's a huge pile of snow blocking me from getting the truck where it's supposed to be. There's not enough space for me to get the truck any closer, any closer to the store. Even after I politely explained that to her, she still got angry at me about it because she's a customer and customers are always irrational when you tell them that you can't do something they ask of you. They get offended when they hear the word no, as if you attack them personally. When you explain to them that you couldn't do what they asked you to do. Like, why can't customers just understand that when you tell them you can't do something, it usually means there's a logical reason why you can't do it. Why do they have to get so angry because of it? So anyway, she says, I'm going to call your manager because you were asleep in the truck when you should have been unloading and you can't figure out how to park the trailer correctly and i'm saying okay listen here i was not asleep in the trailer all day and if you and you better not tell my manager that crazy lie or we're gonna have a problem she then proceeds to call the manager anyway and then tells him that i was sleeping in the truck all morning instead of helping them unload like most customers do at Family Dollar. This isn't the first time I've been falsely accused of sleeping in the truck, by the way. They have a habit of doing that whenever they personally don't like you. Because they, because for some reason customers think when they have some kind of personal agenda against a, a worker for whatever reason, it's okay to try to come in, in between them and their career. So they called me on the phone asking me why I didn't get the trailer any closer to the store and I explained to them because I can't get the trailer at the correct angle because it's a huge pile of snow blocking me and I already explained this to the customer but she won't listen because she's a stubborn hothead. So they told me to take pictures of the situation and then someone that I'm guessing is a bit uh, better expert at backing up than I was would call me and, and give me direction on how to make this maneuver. So I took pictures and I think I still have those pictures and I'll try to show them to you at the end of the video if I can find them. So I took these pictures and sent them to the manager and then I got a call back a few minutes later and they told me oh just turn the steering wheel all the way to the left and then pull forward and you should be able to get the, tra the trailer at the right angle. And I did that thinking, well, I don't see how that's going to work, but I'll try it anyway. I've already tried everything else. <laughs> and it actually worked. And, uh, see, you, it, it takes a lot of uh, creativity to make deliveries at small grocery stores like Family Dollar because every single parking lot is different. Sometimes there's, I mean, there's no generic way that'll work with every location, unlike warehouses, for example. So... Sometimes you really have to get creative when trying to figure out what you're supposed to do with, uh, to get the trailer a certain way. And this, in this case, I was struggling with it because I had less space than I usually did. If that pile of snow wasn't in my way, I could have made that, that delivery without any problems. So anyway, what you're looking at here is a 20th Century Limited. It was a train built by the New York Central System to compete with the Pennsylvania Railroad the Broadway Limited. 
Both of these trains ran from New York City to Chicago. At New York City, the 20th Century Limited departed from Grand Central Station, a station owned by the New York Central Railroad, and the Broadway Limited departed from New York Penn Station. Both of these stations are still in service, but, uh, but the um, Grand Central Terminal is only used for commuter trains these days, while Penn Station is used by Amtrak, New Jersey Transit, and Metro North. Oh yeah, another thing I forgot to say earlier. Why is it that customers think that you're capable of reading their minds? Like, why would a customer only tell you half of what they wanted you to do? And they get mad at you for not guessing what they wanted you to do next. Like, she told me to park the truck in one location. Then she got mad at me for not being able to tell where she wanted the truck later. Like, it, it, this, this problem could have been resolved if you had just told me where you wanted the truck in the first place. Okay, so I programmed that railroad crossing so that if the train stops in front of it, like at the station, it'll automatically turn off unless there's another train headed for the crossing. That way, train stopping at the platform won't have to hold up traffic. This technique is used at real railroad crossings too. There's a driver command you can use to turn these crossings on and off, and I'll show you how to use it in a little bit.
When I model traffic lights that are hanging from wires, I usually place a wire underneath it to help stabilize it in windy weather. But it just occurred to me that here in Pennsylvania, or at least the area where I live, traffic lights usually don't have a wire underneath them to help stabilize them. In fact, it gets so windy here that uh, the traffic lights actually swing so much that you can see the lights fading in and out of view. <laughs> because the beam is designed to travel straight to your eye but um if it's swinging it doesn't do that and they swing very hard in windy weather too so for this one I'm not gonna put a wire underneath the lights just a single wire to support them
These ATLS triggers control the railroad crossings. You need two of them, one to turn the crossing on and one to turn it off. You can also use a four trigger system if you plan on operating the crossing in both directions on each track, which is what most railroad which is how most railroads control them. I'm also going to have a pair of these triggers to control the traffic lights so that the side that's facing the crossing will be green when the crossing activates. That way if there's someone stuck on the crossing by a red light when the crossing activates, they, they have plenty of time to get out of the intersection and out of the train's way. Most real railroad crossings that are near intersections are programmed that way.
I'm looking for the message that you can use to control the traffic lights and the railroad crossings by commanding the train to do so. This is actually slightly realistic because in real life when a crossing turns off the driver can call the railroad crossing on a radio in order to activate it by typing a specific dial tone on the radio. Kind of like a password.
if you give this command while the crossing is off then it'll turn on and if you give the command while the crossing is on it'll turn off but this would only work if the train is not currently resting on the trigger while it's stopping if it's on the trigger then you won't be able to turn it off also on railroad crossings with more than one track if there's another train headed for the crossing it still won't turn off I'm telling it to turn the railroad crossing off and change the traffic lights back to normal when it stops at the platform so that the cars won't have to wait until it finishes picking up passengers before they can finally cross the tracks. And I'm also telling it to turn the crossing back on and to change the traffic lights right before it departs. A lot of railroad crossings that are located near train stations are programmed this way, at least in the United States. In other countries, the crossings would stay on until the train leaves. It just occurred to me that I don't have to program the train to control the railroad crossing when it's traveling in the opposite direction because it would have passed the crossing in order to stop at the platform, so the gates would have gone up anyway. Now I'm going to test the intersection to make sure it's working.
That actually worked better than I expected. The bus was able to get off the railroad crossing before it even activated. Now I'm going to do a few more tests.
And let's try to figure out why this train isn't moving. It says the line is reserved for an oncoming train. It's not supposed to happen on an express line. Yeah, that one says the same thing too. I think I know what might have happened. I think a train might have broken away and is rolling backwards down the hill. And the signal to turn in red to prevent other trains from colliding with it. This is what would happen in real life if something like that happened. And here is the train in question. It's still rolling backwards. It seems to have broken away from another train. Well, luckily for me, that was an empty test train or there'd be a huge lawsuit. <laughs>
try to use this train to rescue the one that's stuck.